All right, um, let's go ahead and get going here and turn on the recording. Don't have too many people here yet. I know one or two actually are um, not going to be showing up. Um, we still have COVID going around and stuff, so I hope everybody's the tier is keeping uh, well, and I hope everybody that watches this later also is <laughs> um, is doing okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, as usual, I I, I will go. I'm going to go over chapter two. I've got some stuff I can talk about, um, but uh, feel free you know, if you want to ask about anything or discuss any part of our materials for this week. Um, there is another chapter or another quiz um, due by Friday. I think I had the date wrong initially, so hopefully I didn't confuse anybody on that. But yeah, I did mean that to be by the end of this week. So same kind of format. So like 10 questions. Um, <clears throat> Uh, there's there's still some fill in the blank kinds of questions, but they uh, ask you to do some things, to do some calculations using like Andel's law or Little's law or something. So I'm really looking for like a number as a result on on those um, fill in the blank questions. Uh, the last two or so on the quiz, um, just to, as a hint for the people who haven't taken it yet. I know a few people have already. So. Um, <clears throat> okay, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I'll go ahead and kind of just start uh, talking. Oh, there are, you know, notes uh, again. So uh, again, I don't know if, uh, you know, everybody saw those or not. Um, um, so I'll try, I mean, just for my own, uh, this is kind of what I normally do when I'm trying to get around, my head around a new textbook as I'll often make my own notes for the thing so these are kind of kind of what I would usually do for my own notes although I'm keeping in mind that I'm kind of putting these out here for you guys to see as well so I might put a little bit more than I might normally put for my own notes um, uh, but there's, there's links for those um, if you want to look at the stuff that I'm and yeah I'll kind of use that to help guide me about um, what we might, uh, what I might talk about here, unless people ask questions and get me off on a different topic or something. So, um, yeah, and I just received actually my, I finally got my the eleventh edition, uh, copy of my eleventh edition. I'm, I'm using kind of the tenth edition um, for my notes and stuff here, but. Um, I did notice that uh, chapter two is basically the same on both editions. I see all of the, um, looks like nothing has changed or almost nothing. Although chapter one actually he had uh, added in or renamed and added in a section, which I didn't really know until I looked at it here today. But really, like I said, it's uh, the, the changes aren't all that big. So if you have edition 10 or even nine, um, most everything that you'll read or that we'll talk about should be pretty much the same. So. Uh, all right, so um, chapter two is, um, maybe I'll just, I don't know if my bandwidth is very good tonight or not. Uh, maybe I'll turn my video on too, just a little bit while I'm talking here. Um, so chapter two, you know, we're beginning to, to dig into a little bit more of the details of, um, computer architecture <coughs> and organization here. So looking at performance, basically, of, um, and, and um, things that you may or may not have known um, as a computer science uh, graduate student, may have run across some of these, but maybe not all kind of all the details of, of things, especially the stuff um, in the first two seconds here. So, oh, oh, by the way, another kind of note, um, I am kind of maybe planning on talking until about eight and maybe taking a bit of break so I can try to get my uh, voice a rest and then come back after and, and, and do a little bit more after that. So, just so you guys can plan. Um, so, we'd kind of brought up uh, Moore's Law 
last time um, and for, from chapter one from last week um, I talked a little bit about performance so um, <clears throat> I might jump right down to jump ahead a little bit, jump right down to this figure here. Um, this, uh, the, the figure showing uh, processor trends um, kind of in relationship to the discussion on Moore's law here. Um, that was kind of the, at the end of the first section uh, here. So we'll come back to all this stuff, but um, um, since I was just thinking about it, so this, this is kind of an important figure. You know, I, I think for, for um, everybody that takes a class like this to understand, this is kind of one of the, the main points of this whole class, is uh, kind of to, to understand why co modern computer architectures are the way they are, um, and to be able to articulate or, or, or understand, you know, kind of trends and things like that, right? Um, so we touched on Moore's Law a little bit last time. Um, and, uh, you know, so by the way, so we're, we're plotting on this particular figure, um, different things. So the number of transistors, so we talked a little bit about the, the history last week. Uh, so we're in kind of the generation, the third generation as our textbook called it, uh, where computers are based on uh, integrated circuits and, um, um, you know, etching techniques to make, uh, the, the, to put, Lots and lots of transistors, basically um, uh, logical units uh, on a single chip, right? So, and Moore's law was really about the originally it was about the the number of, of transistors. So this prediction, um, and notice, I mean, you know, the 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 scale on the y-axis here. So this is transistors in, um, I guess, thousands. Um, so when it's 10 to the six, that's actually a million thousand. So, so here around 2010 is where we were uh, approaching like a, a billion transistors uh, on a chip, right? Uh, but yeah, the, the, the y-axis is really um, a logarithmic, or sorry, yeah, a, a log scale, right? So that, that's important. So, you know, this, the, 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 the line is straight here, but this trend isn't linear. This trend is actually exponential, right? And, you know, uh, even if you haven't heard of Moore's law before, um, you intuitively kind of understand that the great increases that have been happening in computers, or, or at least I hope everybody kind of realizes that probably you know your laptop or your uh, uh, your phone that you carry around in your pocket probably um, has as much or more computing power than you know like the supercomputers of the 1990s or, or you know like the the craze and things like that were much less powerful than your typical laptop that you pay a couple hundred bucks for or your cell phone or that kind of thing right um and and that's kind of a consequence of the advances in the technology and and um um this reduction of um of the uh the basically the size of uh, the, the scale for these chips. So the, the, um, what do they call that? Um, the lith lithography kind of process, right? So they, they keep getting it so that you can make the, basically the, the, the width of the wires and the width of the chan um, of the transistors smaller and smaller. So we're currently in 2020 around five nanometer, nanometer scale, right? Um, and you know, a nanometer is pretty small. It's still like uh, one nanometer, is still about 100 times bigger than typical width of a of a single molecule. So, so I think like a one one hundredth of a nanometer is typically like with the width of a, uh, yeah, a, a, an atom of hydrogen or something like that is, is, a, is approximately there. So we're still two or, two orders of magnitude. Um, bigger than the width of a single atom but but i mean lots of things at the one nanometer scale are molecular width so like dna and things like that are down to that width right just to kind of give you a comparison so i guess people are projecting that maybe by 2022 or 2023 we might get down to, to the three a three nanometer meter process um for semiconductor um technology. I don't know if anybody knows quite how to get to two nanometer. So, um, you know, kind of as I talk 
as I mentioned before, you know, once you start getting down to molecular width, you start hitting um, effects, quantum effects of, you know, phys of physics, basically. Um, so nobody knows how far you can push this, but, but probably once you start getting below one nanometer or something like that, um, you won't really be able to design chips in the same way, right? And, and that would be coming up if this trend holds um, by like 2020 or something like that, right? And we, we really haven't fallen off yet um, on that trend. If you just look at transistors, right? Uh, and yeah, in this graph, in this one, and also in the edition um, 11 of our textbook, only went up to 2010. Um, I was, I was final, finally right at the end here, able to find an example. I think it's pretty much in the same figure because we're showing transistors, um, but up to 2020 here, right? So yeah, we, we, we've continued kind of that exponential tr trend up to 10 to the 7 here about as we're getting into the 2020s or approaching it. Um, but uh, even now, even though the, the, because of the process of this lithography um, and we're continuing to be able to cram exponentially more and more chips, you know, so Moore's law is that the rate is doubling about every two or every 2.5 years. So that's a, so when you're doubling every period of time, that's an exponential growth, right? It goes one, two, four, eight, 16 and explodes real quickly. But uh, even, even as early as the early 2000s or 2005, you can see, or at least they're kind of projecting on this particular figure, uh, that, that some of these curves are starting to, to flatten here because um, we're not really hitting kind of the, 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 the basic physical limits that I was talking about, but uh, there's been heat, heat dissipation problems and other things. So it is, it is still some lim basic limits of physics of, of doing this kinds of things and cramming that amount of stuff um, into that small of a space, uh, causing power um, and um, other uh, kinds of things. So, so as we talked about um, a little bit last week, uh, one of the solutions to that is, I mean, you can still use like a single chip, but if you, if you split it into multiple cores and you rely on parallelism instead of increasing the number of transistors, then you're able to keep the, the, the power from increasing exponentially and, and the heat dissipation from increasing exponentially. Um, but um, that means that uh, because it's really like two separate processors instead of a single one that you're trying to drive at a faster and faster speed. Okay, if, if that makes sense, right? Uh, but but anyway, you know, basically because of this, um, as we touched on a little bit last time, uh, we're already into the age now where we're not completely relying on just the doubling of the basic frequency and clock speed and the number of transistors. Um, um, uh, we've had to make some compromises, and so in order to get equivalent performance gains on our computing systems, we have to turn to parallelism so that we are not building chips that are kind of just melting down. You know? So we have to kind of fall off on making them the, the basic clock speed faster and faster and just have more CPUs, right? And, and, the, and now that trend is beginning to go up. So as of 2010, you know, four and eight cores were kind of the norm. Um, so, you know, we're, we're probably going to be seeing, for, for general purpose CPUs, we're probably going to be seeing pretty common to have like 16 and 32 core. So, so you can see up to here, we're, they're projecting up to like 100 core kinds of chips um, as sort of the norm here, at least for big server sorts of applications and stuff. So. Uh, Okay, so yeah, I mean, I'm, on purpose, I'm kind of spending a little bit of time on this, uh, and I might even talk some more after I kind of jump back up and we come back down to here, but, but yeah, I do kind of consider this 
pretty important sort of concept, you know, so it's one of the things, um, one of the goals of this course that, uh, that you kind of understand is because this is driving a lot of trends in computer science, you know, um, that, that we're seeing um, in the industry and in the science side and stuff like that. So. Uh, all right. So let's talk about some of these other things. So um, there's a, another trend um, that's that's been with us for a long time, though. That um, you know, so, so the the computing uh, uh, building computing systems has been always uh, you know up to this point in time uh, pushing towards greater and greater performance uh, on our systems, right? Um, so, but very early on, there was kind of another performance bottleneck that um, caused a lot of the stuff that we talk about uh, here with um, um, all these things like pipelining and um, techniques for performance here. Uh, and, and that was the, the fundamental problem that, um, that many other parts of the system um, can't keep up with the raw uh, sorts of uh, processing speed that we can get with our CPUs with this sort of semiconductor technology that we're using. In particular, um, memory has been for a long time and still is. I mean, it, ten it tends to, even, you know, the fastest kinds of RAM technology memory right now is like two orders of magnitude slower than it could, that it could be driven to access, you know, to read or write um, a byte of data than the typical processing speed of a CPU, right? And um, don't ask me to explain exactly why that is, but the, because of course, RAM is also using, you know, the similar kind of uh, semiconductor uh, lithography uh, in order to produce it. But, but that's kind of the reality. Um, and that has, has in order to get, you know, so, if um, if you always if, because so, so to go back uh, basically almost every instruction that you run on on a CPU so so the basic instructions of, of a instruction set uh, in a computer architecture um, a lot of them are always doing something with a piece of data so almost all instructions before they can execute have to have a piece of data loaded to memory. Um, in order to do something with that data, you know, so, so gotten from memory uh, into like a register on the CPU uh, to process that piece of data or vice versa. So once you've done a calculation, um, that result maybe has to be stored back in the memory uh, to be used for your results or whatever, right? So because memory is an order or two of magnitude slower than the, uh, to, to be able to access it, then you can typically process um, instructions on your CPU. Um, if, if we didn't have any of these kind of techniques um, in there, we basically wouldn't be able to actually execute one instruction every clock cycle or, or try to achieve that speed. We, we would only be able to execute at the speed that we can fetch um, and store instructions in and out of memory, which again is, is you know, 10 or 100 times slower um, currently and for a while now, right? Um, <clears throat> So yeah, I don't know, our, our textbook, um, I don't remember if it uses this term or not. A lot of people call that the memory bottleneck problem. I probably wrote that in my note somewhere, I can't remember. Uh, but, but yeah, this, this um, because of this basic, um, this basic difference in performance between kind of our best, well, our, our, our typical uh, computing memory, you know, random access memory, um, and our typical performance of our processor, the, the, the raw, in terms of cycles um, um, that, that can be performed. So, um, so 
So our, our textbook talked a little bit about um, those issues about the design with memory and stuff a little bit better than I'm kind of explaining it uh, right here. So, um, but but that's that's the basic idea. So for, for whatever reason, and we're still in this realm, you know. So this 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 sentence here is kind of the heart of it. The the raw speed of the microprocessor is constrained by this memory bottleneck, and it won't achieve its potential unless we can feed it a constant stream of work to do in the form of things uh, and, and yeah I should have mentioned it's not only data but I mean every instruction itself is also stored in memory so we, we talked about the, the concept of a, um, a stored program architecture or a von Neumann architecture so both data and the programs um, are um, in a in our computer memory so you know Everything you have to execute, you have to fetch the instruction uh, before you can decode it and execute it, and then you have to usually fetch some data um, that that instruction works on, right? Um, so, with this memory bottleneck, a lot of engineering kinds of things have had to be done on modern CPUs in order to ensure that you can feed. The, that the beast of your microprocessor. So it's, it, it is getting a smooth flow of instructions and data all the time in order to meet its potential um, maximum performance, right? Um, so, and, and that's basically what, what all these are uh, here. The, these all have to do with, um, with these are really kind of computer organization. So uh, most of this stuff is completely invisible to like a programmer of the operating system or, or you or us as a pro as people writing applications to run on the computing system. So we have no idea about caching that's happening and, and uh, you know, all the stuff in the CPU, like pipelining. So, so caching is also another one that could be on this list, uh, but, but these are things that happen that we think of as, as, as happening in the CPU logic itself. So pipelining, branch prediction, superscalar execution, data flow analysis, and speculative ex execution. And there might be more, um, um, you know, so our textbook here is, is you know, five or 10 years, um, so I'm sure there, there's even more specialized things if, if you want, if we really dug down into the details of these, but these are good to know, especially pipelining um, and branch prediction and, and speculative execution, right? So, so pipelining, um, as the book talks about, um, I mean, it's really the, the assembly line concept. And, uh, and, and, you know, and, and that's, not, that's not a simplification or anything. I mean, it, it is an assembly line. So if you know what we mean by like an assembly line in manufacturing, the, the, the same principle um, is being applied here. So the, 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 the problem is, is that um, a typical instruction, especially on a CISC, on a, on a complex instruction set computer, a typical instruction actually needs more than one clock cycle to run, okay? And, um, um, I can't remember, I guess actually later on, maybe we talk about clock cycles and things like that. But um, so I should mention that, you know, um, as, as it's talked about in this chapter, basically everything that happens in your processor happens on what's known as a clock. So there's, there's a ticking clock, the, the, the system clock. And on every tick is when things happen. So, so basically the, the, the fastest that an instruction can be executed or something that can happen is, is every click, you know, every one click of the clock. That's known as the um, the, uh, the the clock cycle time, right? Um, and that that has to do with the frequency of the, the 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 processor clock. So you'll you'll know that your CPUs. One of the things that if you ask kind of what what are the um, specs of my CPU, uh, you know, you'll ask how many cores it has and kind of how big the caches are on it, but you'll also need to know the, the raw uh, CPU processor speed or, or the clock frequency, right? So clock frequencies nowadays are in, um, um, so this is in megahertz, but, but so this is thousands of megahertz. So we're in the, the, the gigahertz speed, but yeah, notice once, once we got above two or three gigahertz, it hadn't gone much 
So, and, and we're still at about three or four gigahertz. So it's, it's rare to see something more than four, four gigahertz. So, um, um, you know, the, the, uh, the raw speeds had basically stopped. And, and um, again, that's because of this, um, some of the physical limits and the amount of power being generated and moving to multiple cores instead of continuing to process continuing to push the raw uh, processor speed, right? And that is probably not likely to, so, so we're no longer going to be seeing exponential changes in the raw um, clock frequency of our CPU. So it might start, crawl, it might continue to crop a little bit linearly. So, so maybe by 2020, we might be like 10 megahertz or something is, is typical. But, um, but, but not nearly as fast as this exponential growth that we've had, right? Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, so that was kind of a, a, a tangent, but um, uh, that's related to this idea of pipelining because the pipeline is like an assembly line because many instructions, um, uh, especially in a, in a complex instruction set computer, take more than one actual clock cycle to complete the instruction. So if you didn't have a pipeline, um, every, you know, so, so if the average uh, number of cycles you needed to complete an instruction was say five, so, uh, it, so in that case, whatever your raw uh, clock speed was, you would only be able to complete an instruction every fifth clock cycle without a pipeline, right? So you'd only be getting effectively one fifth of the speed, right? So a pipeline, um, if, if my average, uh, if, if on average my instructions need five cycles to complete um, the instruction, um, I might design a pipeline that, that has five, you know, a, a, a five step pipeline. So that, that way, you know, when, when my fifth instruction um, that I'm running is, is ready to be done. And so it, it's basically a parallelization. It's a type of a parallelization, right? So in that case, I would have five instructions if I have a, a pipeline of size five being worked on at the same time, but one instruction is working on the first of its five steps, the, the, num the, the next instruction is on the second of its five steps and, and so on, right? So that's kind of the basic idea on that. So, so in theory then, um, even though for a complex instruction set computer, um, instructions take multiple cycles to finish, I can still achieve or get close to achieving one instruction being executed every clock cycle, which is the fastest you could ever do, right? So hopefully everybody understands that. Let, let me know if, you know, if I'm not being clear. Um, Um, but of course, um, so a couple things on this. I, 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 I think our textbook, actually our textbook doesn't talk a whole lot about this, but you know, because ARM instructions, so, so risk instructions, reduced instruction set uh, computer instructions um, are much simpler. They tend to be much closer to each risk instruction only needs one cycle or two cycles, okay? So pipelining, a lot of these techniques um, are not so um, important for risk chips, risk chips, which makes them their designs uh, quite a bit uh, simpler, right? Um, but uh, but I still I, I think all of these are still in uh, like ARM chips, risk chips, chips, which we'll probably learn about um, um, in a little bit more detail uh, later on in this course. So. Um, but yeah, another thing about about CISC machines, complex instruction set machines, is that you know there is variation. You know, so some instructions might only take need one or two or three clock cycles, and then you might have some other instructions that take eight or nine or ten. You know, so um, so that makes it complex as well to build efficient pipelines um, that will always keep things flowing. So. Um, so even if, um, it, 
even if kind of those problems with, with instructions taking, uh, having a lot of variation on the number of cycles they need, you know, it, 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 even if things were more regular, there's one big um, kind of a wrench, uh, one big fly in the ointment is that uh, there are types of instructions that are branch instructions. And the problem is that whenever you hit a branch instruction, you don't know actually what the next instruction is that, that needs to be fetched and executed after that, right? So that, uh, whenever you come up to a branch, that um, um, potentially means that um, your pipeline is done at that point. So you have to wait till you make the decision about which branch you're going to take before you can start feeding in the pipeline again, right? Um, and, and yeah, whenever your pipeline um, gets interrupted like that, there's a technical term, which I'm going to blank on right now. I can't remember. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you can imagine. So if, if, if you're doing that a lot, um, again, that, that slows down your performance a lot. So and, and, and it, it lessens the use you get out of the pipeline, right? So, so another thing that has come out, up is branch prediction and um, speculative execution, right? So um, if you do hit a branch, you can maybe make a guess, and, and usually it's more than a guess, so you have some reason for guessing true or false, or you're going to take this branch, so pretty much all branches, even in CISC, are, are just a... a, 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 a you know, a, a two-way choice branch, right? So um, either go here or go there, you know, so if it's true, keep executing, or if it's false, then branch to this other instruction. So that, that's the basics of a branch. Um, and uh, through various techniques, I think, um, I mean, you can kind of do better than 50-50 on guessing. So, so, you, so you might make prediction and um, if, if uh, even 50-50 would allow you to. So if you make the prediction, I can feed in. And, and I, I think branch prediction, from the way I understand it, goes hand in hand with speculative execution. So if you make a prediction, you're going to predict that I'm going to take that branch. And then I'm going to start fetching as if my prediction ends up being true and, and uh, fetching those, what I speculate to be the branch I'm going to go to. Right? So you could be wrong. And in that case, um, if you get to that point, and you end up taking the other branch, um, then uh, you do a little bit of wasted work, but it was wasted work in parallel. Um, but if you're right on your prediction, then that, that speculative ex execution, you know, the, you took the right branch, and that work you can keep, and you um, uh, just continue on from there, and then your pipeline doesn't get interrupted um, when you do that. So. And I don't know if this is a thing, but I, I believe you know there's some also where you might do you know both of the branches in parallel, but I don't know I don't know if that's common or not, um, at least for a little bit. Um, um, all right. Anyway, um, superscalar execution. Um, So this is really, uh, this is a little bit hard to explain. Uh, you may, you may want to Google it if you've never heard of, of hyperthreading on like Intel. There's this technology called hyperthreading. If, if your C, Intel CPU has hyperthreading, it might be like a four core chip, but in some ways it'll act like or look like um, an eight core chip, as if it has twice as many cores, right? Um, and and that's, uh, that's, that's because of this, um, what's called superscalar, um, superscaling here. Basically what it is, is um, it's having two program counters, two instruction registers, uh, but both in the same core, right? So, so for a superscalar, some things are shared. So there's only one uh, set of the, the logic for, uh, you know, the, the execution of instructions and things like that. But there is a, um, but there's a, um, a replication of some things that allows for two instructions to be fetched and executed at the same time. So a superscalar or a hyperthreaded core um, is not the same as a completely um, 
standalone separate core. So, so some of the stuff is being shared, but, but in some ways it acts as if it's, it's two cores in, in the one, right? So, so that's, that's kind of what's happening uh, uh, here with, with the superscalar or this hyperthreading technology. So. Um, yeah, and there's lots of other stuff. So, you know, um, I wouldn't be able to, to, to go very deep into details like data flow analysis, but you know, you can do things again, this, this does kind of touch on like theoretical computer science or theoretical mathematics. So you can do things to try and analyze the, um, the, the flow of instructions in order to, so, so a lot of times this pipelining of instructions nowadays using this data flow ana analysis might not occur in the same order that they appear in your program, right? So when you write instructions to a program, they're gonna be specified sequ sequentially. So execute instruction one first, followed by instruction two, followed by instruction three, and, and so forth. But using data flow analysis, it might change the order of, of how those things are executed in the pipeline, basically because again, you know, some instructions might only need two cycles and some need four. So if you rearrange, you might be able to pack these better so that all parts of the pipeline are doing their particular thing at the same time, uh, instead of being empty, if, if that makes sense if you follow me on that so but that that's kind of what those kinds of things um have to do right and the, the, that's what the data flow analysis has to do with um in in terms of chip design here so um so sorry th there's one thing that i wanted to to mention here um so to skip down here to, kind of amazing if you look at the statistics right now so uh, so the first kind of cpus didn't have didn't need any of these things um because uh, you know because there wasn't so much of a performance difference between memory and, and for other uh, issues and, and of course it's very complex to build uh, these kinds of techniques in order to keep up the processor performance but like a modern intel chip um, about half of the integrated circuit is devoted to cache. So if you actually look at your um, typical Intel CPU, 50% of the transistors are really cache. And that's none of the things that we talked about. So cache is another thing um, that we'll talk about later um, in order to address the performance issues and the memory bottleneck, right? But then even among the other half, only about one quarter of the remaining half is really what we would think of as the CPU, the logic to fetch an instruction, uh, and then the, the different logic circuits, you know, for like a load instruction, the, the, the logic circuits to execute the load, or for an addition instruction, you know, but, but that, th those things are really a, a small part of the chip. So most of it is, um, most of it is cache, um, and then of the remaining half, most of that is, is all stuff devoted to this, the pipelining and, and data flow analysis and speculative ex, um, execution and stuff. So somewhat amazingly enough, right? To me anyway. It's, um, but that, this is all needed in order to maintain um, the, um, the, the processor performance, given kind of the engineering constraints of, of the other parts of the computing system. So. Um, this is kind of an aside, maybe um, some people you might have heard of Spectre or Meltdown, um, they're related. Um, so Spectre, it's a security issue, security vulnerability. Um, and it, it's basically because of this branch prediction um, um, feature here. So my understanding of it, again, not, the, I'm also not really a security person, but my understanding of Spectre, and, and Meltdown is related to it, but it's not exactly the same, but Spectre especially is, is because of um, the speculative execution. So it turns out that if you set up things in a particular way, um, you can make it so that that at a branch point, it, it, 
you know, it's, it doesn't end up doing the branch that ends up getting speculatively executed, but you can query the CPU for those statements that aren't actually going to be used and those leak information about the calculation. So in particular, they, they, you can use that to leak information about um, the password hash or other things that are, that you set it up to calculate. And from that you can, um, you know, um, uh, uh, increase, you know, uh, break um, um, security, um, um, incre increase your uh, privilege level by, by looking um, at the results of the, the ghosts. It's, it's called spectra, Spectre because it kind of leaves a ghost of these calculations that allow you to uh, know things that you shouldn't know about what, um, you know, what, what, what your password is or your hash is or something like that. Yeah, and as far as I know, they haven't really had a completely 100% uh, solution for this yet. Um, so kind of the, the first solutions that I know of on like Linux operating systems was, well, you know, we don't know how to actually um, guard against this. So if this is something that if, if you're in a real high secure environment, you basically have to turn off speculative execution and branch pred prediction down at the CPU level. And this causes a big performance hit. So you turn that off and all of a sudden you're, you're going to be getting, you know, 25%, 33% less performance. I don't know if it was quite that bad, but, but, but a significant amount, a, a significant decrease in performance um, if, if you're not allowed to kind of use that stuff in order to avoid this bug. So, yeah, and I don't know what the current, um, that wiki article might tell. I mean, I think there's been some fixes for special cases of it, but not in general yet. So. Um, okay, so yeah, it's already past eight here. Uh, I probably actually have already kind of skipped ahead and talked about most all these things here. Uh, let me see here. Um, So, um, so yeah, I mean, I've mostly been talking kind of ahead here about most all these issues. So all these things we've been talking about um, are really because of this memory bottleneck issue. Um, so lots of things help. Um, so, so these performance uh, processor techniques for performance um, are part of um, helping out with that. Cache is a big part of that. Okay, so so even though RAM um, is, is orders of magnitude slower, um, I mean, you can actually build memory that can keep up with um, the CPU or almost. I mean, that's really what cache is. Cache is just a memory that's faster than your typical uh, RAM, uh, almost as fast as uh, like registers, right? In fact, um, cache, so, so it used to be that cache was on a separate chip between RAM and the CPU, but now nowadays, you know, cache has been moved uh, instead of being a separate chip, uh, it's on the same integrated circuit. So like, as we've already talked about it, it uh, up to about half of that. And, and um, the other thing is that, um, you know, instead of having just one level of cache, and typically there's at least two, if not three levels of cache, right? Um, and, and, and yeah, again, I think we're gonna talk even in more detail later on about cache here, but, but, but uh, this is this is really probably the biggest thing that's done to mitigate kind of these memory performance issues, right? So with a cache, um, uh, the, the, I mean, you might ask, so why don't you just make RAM? Why don't you just make everything um, uh, all cache? Make make a, a cache as big as your random access memory, uh, but like in the same way that you do it on your CPU chip, right? Um, and the, the, the answer is, yeah, I can't maybe give you a real good answer, but um, um, there, there's a cost thing there. So um, uh, you can make fast memory like that uh, and, and have it like the transistors on your CPU um, integrated circuit, but you can't get a whole lot of it like that. So if, if you wanted to get the same, you know, typical 8, 16, 32 gigabytes of memory, all at the same speed that you get for level one or level two cache, 
um, uh, you would increase the cost by a hundred times or a thousand times right now with the current manufacturing techniques, right? So it would be possible, but your computers would be um, costing tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars to um, um, to use it all uh, kind of as as the same technology that we build our cash with if that makes sense, right? So that, that cost performance trade-off is sort of the issue there. Um, so who knows though, I mean, the memory technologies might come along that, that lessen that gap. And that would, that would be a big deal for processor design. So all of a sudden you wouldn't really need that cash or you wouldn't need it so much anymore if, if basic processor speed could be built that worked as fast as, as the, as your processors, um, but was still as cheap, and you could have as much of as as what we kind of need today, right? So, um, yeah, and other things, um, you know. So, so the the increase of the basic um, architecture uh, size, so the, the the which which is most directly seen as the size of the bus between components, so from 8 to 16 to 32 to 64 bit uh, machine architectures, and that has a little bit to do with performance. Again, you know, if I'm transferring 64 bits instead of 8 bits at a time for every clock cycle, I'm doing more in parallel, I'm getting more performance, more bandwidth, so. Um, so one last point here, and then I'm going to take like maybe a, a five minute break till 8.15. So, so yeah, I mean, again, back to if, if you want to increase um, processor, um, uh, actually, I, I shouldn't say speed here. So if you want to increase performance, there, there's three ways to kind of uh, achieve increased performance. So one is you can increase the, the fundamental speed of the processor. So, so you can have more transistors, so you have more logic gates and things like that, but, but also more fundamentally, uh, you can increase the basic uh, processor clock rate um, or, or clock cycle speed, right? Uh, but again, we're, we're, we're reaching limits here. We're, we're not able to do that because of um, power and heat um, generation. Um, so besides that, you can increase the size and speed of caches. So the memory bottleneck is a big reason why um, computer performance is limiting. So to address that memory bottleneck, you need faster memory. Um, and if it's too expensive to make faster memory, then you need to have really good caches that are basically faster memory that you interpose between your processor and main memory. And, and so a lot of that has been happening in the last decade, 15 years. Uh, and then most of the stuff I was talking about just now, then you can also change the speed of instruction execution. So that has to do with all these techniques, pipelining and, and um, branch predict prediction and, and superscalar. So this is really, I mean, all of this, has to do with um, basically increasing the parallelism for the most part. So that's really what pipelining is, and that's what really, really what superscalar architectures are. You know, you're you're making more and more stuff happen in parallel um, every clock's tick, every tick of your CPU clock. So. Um, All right, so yeah, like I said, um, um, I'm gonna take a little break here. Does anybody have, want to ask any questions? And even though I only did the first section, I'll mostly just talk about Amdell's Law and stuff next here for the, most of the rest. So uh, let's, let me, let's take a little break till about uh, 8.20 here, so about eight minutes. And then I'll do from 8.20 to like nine or 9.10 or something like that, so. All right.
Okay, um, hopefully you have everybody's back. Ready to continue on. Hopefully I got my mic on. Yeah, I think so. Um, so next next section is pretty short, um, but there's one kind of one thing I definitely wanted to, to talk about these GPUs a little bit. Um, so we've already talked a lot about multi-core, right? So at this point, I hope everybody knows what we mean by that. The, the difference between, so uh, you know, a, a typical computing system like a server um, can be both multi-CPU, but, but um, it can also be multi-core. It could be either multi-CPU or multi-core um, or uh, more typical for servers today is both multiple CPU chips in it uh, with each chip being a multi-core chip. Right, so you know, a typical server that you're going to find in a in a server rack room uh, is going to have uh, lots of um, lots of blades plugged in there, and they're typically going to be have like two or four CPUs, and each CPU is going to be a four core, an eight core, or something like that. So, um, but um, but yeah, for all many reasons that we've mentioned, you know, um, that's where the trend is going. Uh, you, a lot of personal devices might not be multi-CPU, so a typical laptop might only have one uh, CPU chip on it, but it, but they will be multi-core. So, so your laptop probably has at least four CPUs, if not eight, depending on how recently you might have bought it. So, um, so and that trend is only going to continue. Um, so, uh, you know, look out for, I mean, especially for servers. So I don't know if multi-core, multiple cores is too much more useful in uh, like consumer devices, right? So, I mean, certainly if you're a high end, you know, if you're doing lots of uh, video editing and processing or like, like a, a developer compiling big, um, big projects, where lots of CPUs, you know, or, or uh, that might be useful, that can, can can be run at the same time to 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 compile lots of um, uh, of uh, source files in parallel. Um, but um, but yeah, it's maybe a little bit unclear to me. Um, you know, once you get above eight or sixteen or so for you know your typical cell phone or um, uh, user, um, that they'll be it'll be easy to use all of those uh, uh, cores um, uh, among the, the three or four applications or five applications you might be running at the same time. So um, anyway, um, I did want to mention about GPUs. I know a little bit about these be, uh, because um, if there's anything, uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of a, a computational scientist or a, you know, a scientific programmer. So, so general purpose GPUs become really important um, in scientific computing and machine learning um, starting, I mean, at the, about the beginning of the 2000s, okay? So, um, so, so first of all, everybody knows, um, or you should kind of know what a GPU is. So we, we talked a little bit about general purpose processors versus special purpose processors in the previous chapter. So a GPU is probably the most, um, easy to identify example of a special purpose processor. Um, you might have some other examples might be uh, lots of systems you do digital signal processing. So you might have a specialized DSP, digital signal processing processor. Um, often you actually have microcontrollers which are specialized processors on like your um, hard drives or on your direct memory access. Uh, portions in, in your computer. So those are s separate components in your computing system, but they have their own specialized CPU. Um, um, often your network uh, chip um, or your network subsystem uh, will have a small microcontroller processor that's uh, doing things to handle the uh, TCP IP stack at a low level for different things and so on, right? So your GPU um, is an example. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a different kind of specialized processor. So uh, the you're probably the most well known are NVIDIA um, 
GPUs, and, and, and I know lots of people are gamers, so you, you, you might know or use, have your own NVIDIA. Um, uh, these are mostly used in personal computers as a perif an example of a peripheral that you'll uh, plug into like your PCI slot or some peripheral slot on your computer, right? But a, a GPU is a specialized computer in its original design. It was specialized to process pixels in order to drive um, um, a video display, you know, especially like a, a, a high density video display uh, for gaming or other purposes, right? So the design of uh, for, for processing pixels to drive a display is that often what you're doing is you're um, processing vectors or matrices in parallel, but what you're doing is you're usually applying the same operation, so the same instruction, but you're, you're applying it to all the pixels on the screen or, or lots of pixels in parallel. So, so that, that's typically what you need to do for a GPU to render um, um, uh, like a 3D um, uh, image uh, for a computer game or something like that, right? And you have to do that very fast so I can render, you know, 60 frames per second or higher so that you get smooth um, uh, uh, simulated video, or, or, right? So hopefully lots of you or some of you are kind of familiar with, with all that. Right. But it, it, it turns out that, um, uh, so, so that kind of processor that I just mentioned, a GPU, is different from um, a general purpose processor. Because in a general purpose processor, you have one instruction that's executed on one piece of data, every instruction cycle. What's happening in a GPU is you're, you're executing one instruction every cycle, every clock cycle, but that instruction is executed on many, many pieces of data. So, uh, you know, what was thought of uh, on, on many, you know, calculations on many pixels in parallel. So really what a GPU is, it, they typically have like 1,024, you know, some power of two, 2,048 um, processors, but these are special purpose processors that, that, that they're all running the same instruction so they're all running the same um, uh, sequence of instructions in parallel, but each one has their own piece of data um, that they're executing the instruction on, all right? And it turns out um, that is very useful, not just for um, driving video displays for video games. Uh, I mean, exactly that same kind of thing is needed for lots of scientific computing. So especially in machine learning and deep learning, um, so so you can get you can get speed ups of two, three orders of magnitude, so ten, hundred times, a thousand times are not atypical. If instead of doing your calculation on your processor on your general purpose processor, if you reprogram it to run on a GPU. Um, and use all the 1024 cores uh, in order to do your matrix calculations um, uh, in parallel. Um, you'll get significant speed ups. Okay? So beginning with, uh, again, about the early 2000s, um, uh, people, especially for neural networks and deep learning, started using GPUs uh, to get these incredible speed ups in their calculations for the, their machine learning systems, right? So, but you know, the, the you know even even today, the the original NV, Nvidia's, which are still um, the most used for this kind of scientific computing, um, they are designed for doing graphical um, processing. So you kind of have to shoehorn uh, your scientific calculations into it a little bit, but but we're beginning to see. Um, some some new GPUs, and they probably shouldn't be called graphical processing units anymore. Um, but 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 yeah, the, the term general purpose computing on GPUs kind of refers to this using GPUs, these type of, of processors um, 
um, for scientific computing, not, not just for uh, display, uh, the driving displays, right? Uh, and a new generation of specialized processors meant for general purpose uh, scalar um, matrix uh, parallel processing um, are being um, designed by like Google and, and other people. So we'll see, but but those promise to to um, have a, even another big leap in terms of what might be able to be done with typical um, AI and deep learning. So I'm kind of excited about those things coming down the block here. So. Um, okay. So I wanted to talk a little bit about Amdahl's law and Little's law then, um, kind of like I mentioned at the start here, um, I, I did kind of add some questions where I asked you to do some calculations using one or both of these. Uh, so you might run into that on your quiz this week. Um, so Amdahl's law is, is important because it has to do with parallelism. So because, you know, in order to keep seeing increases in performance, we're having to turn more and more to executing things in parallel. That makes this all the more important um, in order to make back of the envelope design decisions or calculations about how much speed up in theory we can get um, by parallelizing some, some task, right? So, um, so first of all, just a definition of speed up. So speed up is just a measure of how much faster something goes when you compare two things, okay? So, so of course, if you, you just take the ratio of, of the, the, the time to execute after you've sped it up divided by the time to execute before you did whatever, you know? So, so speed up can be done, you know, I can figure out the speed up if I, if I improve my algorithm, you know, so, so for, for coding or whatever, you can calculate a speed up. It's, it's, it's just that ratio between your sped up time to the original time, right? So when we're talking about parallel, um, the, oh, the I, I, I did it backwards though. So um, the, the, the typical way it's defined is um, uh, the, the time, the original divided by the time speed up. Because you're normally, if, if you're speeding something up, it's gonna go faster. So it might be five times faster. So you intuitively know what we mean by that. So something that took, an, um, that took five hours, if I've sped it up five times and not, and not only take one hour, that's, that's what we mean by five times speed up, right? And that, that's all this is doing here. Um, so just a couple of definitions. Um, um, so we can talk about the total execution of time of the program before we sped it up. Um, since since we're, we're mostly thinking about speeding up things in terms of parallelizing parts of the task, uh, we have some idea of the number of processors, so how many chunks we can parallelize our task into. That's what n is. So it's not necessarily just processors, as, as we'll talk about. You know, it could be... Um, some other idea of, 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 of how much we're parallelizing things, right? Um, but this is kind of the important part here though, that one of the difficulties with parallelizing work is that some work is easy to parallelize, okay? So, I mean, the reason why um, buying a big um, Amazon, uh, uh, what do they call it? You know, a big uh, AWS uh, server with uh, 128 uh, CPUs works well if I need to scale up is because lots of tasks are perfectly par parallelizable, right? So if I'm running a server that needs, a web server, let's say, that needs to service people, um, if I have 128 CPUs, I can service 128 people in, par in parallel. 
uh, none of the work I'm doing for one other person has any effect on the work I need to serve my, my website or whatever for any of the other 120, 127 people um, that, that I might be serving in parallel with 128 CPUs, right? So that's perfectly parallelizable task, uh, is something like that, right? Lots of tasks aren't like that. So lots of tasks in like scientific computing, um, you can parallelize some of it, but at some point you get to, to a point where you've got some information that you have to communicate to all the subtasks before they can then uh, continue to do some more work in parallel. So, so typical, um, well, not typical, but, but lots of tasks um, that aren't perfectly parallelizable have this sequence of, of where you do a little bit of, of, of some calculation in serial, then you do a lot of work in parallel, and then you have to gather all the results of that work in parallel um, um, to do something. And then you, have to calc then you have to communicate or transmit the result of gathering that back to all of your parallel workers uh, to, to do some more work in parallel. So you keep, um, you keep cycling that between, you know, um, um, uh, transmitting out to all the parallel tasks, some work to be done, and then gathering all the results into one result, and then transmitting out again to do some more parallel work. So, um, so anyway, um, um, uh, the, the Andal's law is kind of a, a theoretical way of calculating the amount of speed up in theory that you can get, because if, if things are perfectly parallelizable, then um, I can, I can have as much speed up as I want as long as I have enough money to keep throwing more and more CPUs at it, right? Or more and more processors. So again, if, if I want to be able to serve a billion people simultaneously, if I have enough money to buy a billion CPU or to buy everybody their own process, their own uh, computer to run my, um, my server at the same time, um, then um, I, I will have a billion times speed up, right? Um, but yeah, not everything is perfectly parallelizable. So when it's not perfectly parallelizable, you have some fraction of the task that could be parallelized, F, um, and some fraction of the task that's inherently serial. Um, so some other textbooks, they give a separate, that, so they might call this S. You might call this P for the parallelizable part and S for the serial part. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, that has to add up to one, uh, you know, so, so, you can, so F and one minus F. Um, there, there's a relationship between the, the, the fraction that's serializable and the fraction that's parallelizable um, of our task. It has to add up to one whole of the task. So. Um, I mean, you can, you can kind of work out Andal's Law from first principle, which, um, which, uh, I should have had a whiteboard here that maybe I could have done that. Um, but um, maybe as a simple example, if um, let's say you have nine CPUs and let's say 90% of your task is parallelizable and 10% and, uh, of your task is serial, uh, is, is inherently serial, right? So if I have a task um, that if, when I execute in serial takes 100 seconds, that had that breakdown that I talked about. Um, if I parallelize it, then then ten percent um, has to be done in serial. So that means ten percent of the hundred seconds or ten seconds can't be parallelized, right? Um, and then, so so I've got ten seconds that would have to go to the the serial part. Um, and then among the other ninety seconds, if I have nine CPUs, I can evenly distribute them on the nine CPUs. So the ninety seconds that I was doing before can all be done on parallel and then I and reduce down to 10 seconds. So that, that would reduce the total time from 100 down to 20 seconds uh, in that back of the envelope that I was doing there. Or 100 by 20 is a, is a five times speed up, right? Um, That's, that's the kind of thing that we're, that we're kind of talking about here. So I kind of skip over these. Um, but like I said, I mean, if, if you think about this, if you, you, you could work this out from 
first principle. So, so um, from this, all we're doing is saying that our original task, um, before we paralyze any portion of it, is going to be the total time times the serial part plus the total time times the, the parallel part. That's all this is up here. But after we parallelize it, we can reduce the time for the parallel part by running them in parallel on whatever number of processors we have available. So, so this part can't be reduced. That's, that's, that stays the same. That's the serialized portion. But this part of the time will reduce depending on how many CPUs that we can throw at it to parallelize the parallelizable portion of our task here, right? If you rearrange then, you know, so actually the T's can factor out. Um, and if you factor out the T's, you get one minus F plus F. So you end up with one over here. So you get the simple, simplified form just by factor, factorizing this out and, and simplifying. So. But it would give you the same calculation if you did it either way, right? So anyway, by using this, then I, you, can, I, you can easily ask questions like, um, um, right, so if 95% of the task is parallelizable and I have 100 CPUs, how much speed up can I get? Or, or here, um, oh, and, and then the other thing that I kind of emphasize on this is that this also allows you to figure out that if, if part of the task is, it can't be parallelized, there's gonna be an upper limit, an, an upper asymptotic limit, right? And that's basically, it is easy to understand if, if you think about this, because essentially, if um, the part that I can parallelize, if, if this part is perfectly parallelizable, if, if I can keep adding more and more CPUs, I can, I can essentially drive the amount of time needed for the parallelizable portions of the task down to zero, okay? So as the number of, of, of CPUs goes towards infinity, this term goes to zero and you're left with really the only time then is the, the non-parallelizable portion of the task, right? So for a task that um, is 95% uh, parallelizable, leaving 5% that's inherently serial, the, in theory, I can only speed it up 20 times. Because again, if you think about it, uh, again, if, if, my, if my task takes 100 seconds, that means, uh, you know, five percent of the task is not is serial, so so I need twenty seconds. You know, um, uh, I'm sorry, I need um, uh, one twentieth or or, or um, five seconds um, to do the serial part, and then the rest of the part I can parallelize. If I have lots of CPUs, I can get that as close to to zero as I possibly can. If I can throw lots of processors at it, leaving five seconds for the inherently non-parallelizable part or a 20 speed up is the maximum speed up that you can get okay so hopefully everybody can think about that and understand why that is and how that happens right it, it's completely a function of how much of the task you can parallelize it will, will tell you how, what the maximum speed up is that you can expect to get from paralyzing your task here. This is, this is one of the first things that you do if you ever take a, a, a class directly on um, parallel programming, so writing threaded or parallel applications. Um, um, one, of the, one other thing that our textbook doesn't uh, talk about, uh, there is one simplification that's being made here um, because again, uh, the, the portion that you parallelize uh, in order for this to be able to kind of ignore this, in order to calculate the asymptotic limit here, um, the, uh, you have to assume that it's perfectly parallelizable, right? So if it's perfectly parallelizable, you can drive this close to zero and you're only left with the serial portion, right? But again, the lots of tasks like you do this in parallel programming, um, it's often the case that the parallel the parallel part uh, you can't isn't perfectly parallelizable. So there's going to be some overhead. So so you might have to pass some messages back and forth and things like that 
um, to do that, right? So this is a little bit of a simplifying assumption here. So somebody was saying, um, and I kind of agree. I mean, you know, I'm, 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 I, that might be like a good assignment. I'm, I'm still trying to, to to come up with some kind of good assignments for this course, but but maybe we could do a little something with like doing some threaded program or like calculating speed up with some real threaded programs or something like that. So, or, or parallel programming. So. Um, so anyway, back to Amdahl's law. So um, if you are kind of in this domain though, where you're trying to parallelize some bit of work um, and, and if you really want to increase your speed up, it's, it's of course crucial that you, identify and you maximize the portion of the task that you uh, can do in parallel. That is going to have a big effect on the, the speed up in theory that you're going to be able to achieve, right? So, so if you go from a 95% to a 99% parallelizable task, you increase the theoretical speed up from 20 to 100 times um, in that case. So. Um, yeah, and this is the same figure from our textbook, although I added in a 99% line as well here. So you see, but, but again, you know, this, the, these do illustrate those asymptotic limits, right? So for 95% uh, parallelization, fractional parallelization of 95%, you reach an asymptotic limit of a 20 times speed. That's the best you can do, right? For 99%, um, it will eventually get up to 100 times speed up. Um, although, as you can see, I mean, the number of CPUs you have does make a difference. So, so once you get to higher and higher fractions of parallelization, 1,000 CPUs, you're only going to be able to uh, push it up to 80 or 90 times speed up there. You, you have to get more like 10,000 CPUs to start approaching your theoretical limit there. So. Um, but, uh, and let me kind of, um, mention this example here before I move on, uh, because it's, it's not just about parallel programming. Okay. So, so, so anytime you've got a task, um, that, uh, for example, like, like here, like talking about processor design. Um, so if we have a task, um, or if we have, um, or let's say designing a CPU. So if we have a CPU um, where 40% uh, of the, 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 the tasks that you execute on the CPU are floating point operations and the other 60% are other kinds of operations. So um, regular scalar operations or energy operations or logical operations, right? So in that case, in terms of, of design, um, if you want to know how much speed up you might get um, by redesigning your floating point operations to increase the, their factor. So uh, increasing the, 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 the factor of the performance of your floating point operations is the same as upping the, um, um, the, the amount of parallelization. So, you know, if I, if I can increase if I can speed it up by a factor of 10, um, that, that's like um, dividing, uh, like having 10 CPUs for, for you know, so, so making it 10 times faster um, for my floating point operations, right? So the, the reason why this is useful then is that, uh, okay, so, so given that, um, in theory, you know, this can tell me, you know, whether it's useful for me to put into the work designing, redesigning the floating point operations on my chip, uh, you know, how much speed up I might be able to get by doing that, right? So, so again, if in theory, um, I could have um, thousands or tens of thousands of, of an improvement, um, I would end up with one over 0.6 of a speed up, which is a 1.6. That, that's the maximum. That's, that's going to be the asymptotic limit of the speed up. Um, if I can make floating point operations as fast as I need to, right? But uh, you, you can find out what the practical um, speed up would be, you know. So, so um, if... Um, 
if, if I'm, if I'm only going to be able to redesign my chip and get a, a speed up of a hundred times, um, I can, um, plug that in. Um, and find out um, what the uh, theoretical speed up would be. So, um, uh, that's kind of where the, the 1.65 comes from here. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it's, uh, if, 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 if I'm only going to be able to achieve a speed up of 10 um, on my floating point operations on the chip, you know, it's, it's about 1.5, right? So, but that gives you an idea, right? And, and that might well be worth it. Um, uh, so, so maybe it's relatively easy to, to, to get 10 times improvement by redesigning the, the floating point logic. Um, so it might, it might cost a lot more to push it up to 100, uh, but that only um, increases the speed up from 1.5 to 6 to 1.65, you know, so, so, um, so if it's relatively cheap to, to get a 10 times improvement, we might want to go ahead and do that, right? So that, that's, that's the kinds of things you can do with, with Andel's law. So again, the asymptotic limit on this, if I just make K really big, um, should be about 1.67, like we say here, so. One point, yeah, so it's probably 1.6666, one and two thirds repeating. If, um, so I mean, exactly, we know exactly what it is. So the, the asymptotic limit is just one divided by 0. 0.6. So, yeah, right, that's what it is. But yeah, this kind of tells me, kind of eyeballing it, that, um, that um, it might well be if, if, if it's pretty cheap to, to get a 10 times improvement on my floating point operations. Um, I mean, that, that's, that's a nice improvement. You know, so that, that's, you might want to go ahead and, and um, put the effort into doing that. So. Um, all right. I'm sure we'll use this a little bit. I, I, again, I haven't done this course before, so I don't know how much he comes back to Amdahl's Law and Little's Law, um, but uh, hopefully we'll use it some more for these kinds of calculations about design decisions for things, stuff like that. Um, Little's Law um, is another, again, I'm assuming that, that we will find some use for it. Uh, this one has to do, though, with... Um, Um, it, it's, it's really something from queuing theory, which is um, a big, uh, it's a big thing in, in theoretical computer science. So there's lots of work in theoretical computer science using queuing theory because lots of things in a competing system can be modeled as a, um, as a, as a client server sort of um, um, system where you've got work or tasks coming in that you will queue up and, the, and then you have one or more processors which are the servers which will take things off of the queue and process them and then you have questions about you know um, if I have to have certain limits about um, um, how big the to keep the queue manageable or I want to limit the amount of wait time um, that any item waits on the queue before being serviced in my computing system. Um, you could use this basic Little's Law um, for questions like that or, or to compute um, um, uh, things of that nature. Um, so this, this is relatively simpler. Uh, um, 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 I mean, and it, it, it works out, again, if you kind of play around with this, you can kind of convince yourself. So under steady state conditions, there's a, basically, all this to say is there's a relationship between the average number of items that are waiting. Um, so that's, that's, that's the total number of items that are on your queue in average under steady state conditions, right? So that's a relationship between um, the rate of arrival, so Greek lambda is often used for arrival rates, 
in queuing theory, like we're using it here. Uh, and then the average wait time, right? So again, I mean, and, and you can use these things for calculating stuff like, uh, you know, like, like queues in, in a restaurant or a, a coffee shop or things like that. So, so if you ask, um, um, uh, you know, this will directly give you if, if, um, if customers are arriving um, every, you know, 10 customers arrive every minute, um, so that'd be a, a, an arrival rate of 10 per minute if you're using a minute for your unit time. And if the average wait time um, is like three minutes, you know, that, that tells you that um, under steady state conditions, uh, you're going to have 30 people kind of waiting in your line, 10, 10 times three here, um, uh, to get serviced, right? Um, So, yeah, so like, like I, I think the book talked about an example similar to that somewhere, I'm not seeing it. So, so in that case, like, like for a physical space, that might tell you, you know, I mean, is that sufficient? Um, is, is my store big enough under COVID conditions to maintain um, social distancing uh, that I can still service people at that rate? You know, if not, you know, maybe I have to add more servers so that we can reduce the, the average wait time so that we can keep our average line length to 10 people um, uh, to maintain COVID distancing. Now, that kind of, those, those are the kinds of questions that you can answer with um, Little's Law. So, so but, but yeah, very, very useful for lots of general purpose ideas where, so, so for, for, Computer architecture and like multi cores, um, um, there can be lots of or, or operating systems. There, there's lots of situations like um, uh, like thinking about CPUs. Um, um, if we have like eight CPUs, you can think of each of them as a server of of um, of instructions um, that you want to um, process. Although that's that's a little bit of a simplification, you, know, you can't exactly do that. Uh, uh, so it's better to think of, of the CPUs as servers of actual processes. And so not single instructions, but of actual processes that are ready to run. Um, and then you can make calculations about um, uh, like thinking of the, the, the ready processes as, as waiting in a single queue that get assigned to the next CPU that becomes available. Um, and and so on, uh, doing calculations with, with things like that. So. All right. So yeah, I didn't. I didn't have, um, um, if if we later on use these, we can maybe go into these more. Um, but it's good to at least understand the basics of these and Andal's law at this point. Kind of what we potentially might use these for. So. Um, okay, I'm, um, there's actually lots of equations in, in the next session and the next session on section on uh, calculating the mean. I'm not going to spend nearly as much time on these. I mean, we, we might use these, but um, um, I'm probably going to go quickly through he, these and kind of wrap up. Um, so a lot of these topics we've, we've touched on a bit. Um, so this is what, where I was looking for, um, where we talked, where our textbook talked a little bit about clock cycle. So, so all processors are governed by a system clock. Um, and and the, the basic clock cycle is how many ticks. So, so this is usually measured in megahertz. So that's how many millions of cycles per second, right? So uh, a three gigahertz CPU is actually operating at 3,000 million or, or 3 billion clock cycles per second, right? So that, that's what three gigahertz is. It's 3,000 million. So that, that, means every, uh, that means the fundamental ticks that are governing a three gigahertz CPU is we've got 3 billion of those happening every second, right? And then again, using these techniques we've talked about in theory, if we can approach um, executing one instruction every clock cycle, um, and we can only approach that if 
we are feeding our beast well, you know, so if, if we're getting instructions from memory fast enough and if we're using the pipelines in order to, uh, even though most instructions take more than one clock cycle to execute, we're using the pipelines well so that we're essentially getting one instruction completed in every cycle, right? Um, but, um, but yeah, so, so assuming that's all true, um, if we can approach one instruction per cycle, that means for a three gigahertz system, we can um, actually execute 3,000 million or 3 billion instructions every second. And, and that's really what MIPS is. If you go through these calculations, then I won't go through in detail. But yeah, the, the number of instruction completed per, per um, so, so MIPS is millions of instructions per second. So, so, it's, so you divide it by a million, basically. Um, um, but, but yeah, if we're, if we're calculating, if, if we're actually completing the full 3 billion instructions per second, that's, um, um, that's 3,000 MIPS, right? 3,000 million instructions per second, if I, if I did that <laughs> correctly. Uh, in my head, um, but, but yeah, I mean, that's essentially what three gigahertz would get you if we are um, executing one instruction every clock cycle on a, on a three gigahertz system. You'd get 3,000 MIPS. Uh, but yeah, so for a real system though, uh, begin again, because of all these things you have to do in order to actually attain that speed, you won't normally get um, the the number of MIPS that you might be able to get in theory if you're executing one instruction every clock cycle. So that's where you can do an empirical measure. So for a given task, you can actually measure how many instructions we complete um, and to calculate the actual MIPS or the actual number of instructions per second that we're getting on a particular task, right? Um, Oh, and, and by the way, so yeah, another thing about this is that um, um, it, it's, uh, there is some apples and oranges comparisons going on here. So, so that, that's one reason why instead of using raw measures of MIPS or megaflops, um, uh, we often have to turn to benchmarks if we want to compare programs that might be running on different architectures because uh, running a million, you know, so running one MIP or one million instructions per second on a, an Intel CISC system, um, it, it's hard to compare whether you're getting the same amount of work if I'm running one million instructions per second on an ARM RISC processor. Because one instruction on ARM um, doesn't do nearly as much as one instruction on an Intel CISC, right? So if they're both running at, at uh, 1,000 MIPS or 3,000 MIPS, um, I might be getting much less work done, uh, even though they're, they're getting the same performance in, in terms of million instructions per second, uh, I might be getting much more work done on my CISC machine than on my RISC machine even though they're running at the same number of instructions per second, right? So, so again, you know, so, so you can't just compare MIPS, e even to, to, to two CISC machines, uh, you know, on two different Intel architectures. It's dangerous to just directly do that and say, well, I'm getting more MIPS, so um, this one's better, right? So you have to take other things into consideration. Um, And megaflops is, is the same as MIPS, but if you're interested only in floating point operations, you might empirically measure, um, our, our textbook didn't use IF, but, uh, but you could have done the same thing, measure the number of instruction, floating point instructions executed over some time and, and calculate your megaflops. So, so it, megaflops are often used in measures for um, supercomputing and scientific computing because most of the calculations we have to do for scientific computing have to be done using floating point calculations. So we want to 
to know effectively how many flops or mega flops um, or giga flops we're getting. So, so if you if you go Google the um, uh, the 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 fastest supercomputers, um, they're measured in petaflops um, nowadays or, or multi petaflops, you know, which is thousands of uh, gigaflops. So. Um, yeah, and I think that's all I have to say. I mean, there were a lot of kind of equations on here, but uh, they're not really that, that all that, um, um, impressive, you know, it's really coming down to, you know, the, the MIPS is really just measuring the number of, of instructions divided by time or divided by a million um, uh, to get mega instructions, per, millions of instructions per second. So. Um, and also, I don't have a lot to say about the mean. So, so you know, I'm, I'm, I, I hope everybody's familiar with the standard arithmetic mean. That, that's normally what we say by calculating the mean or the average. That's, that's the arithmetic mean. So um, I haven't done a lot of benchmarking. Um, uh, so I don't know how true this is, but apparently in, in benchmarking, it's, it's common to, to use other means like the geometric mean or the harmonic mean instead of the arithmetic mean when you calculate a single number benchmark, right? Um, so I don't know if I could say whether uh, these are true or not, they, they gave some indications of what of where it might be more appropriate to use the arithmetic mean uh, versus the harmonic mean versus the geometric mean. Right? Uh, I don't think I'm going to say a lot about that, so, so we might come back to that. Um, but um, um, but yeah, at the end, um, um, I personally I have run across um, these. Um, these benchmarking specs. I don't think I had any questions in the, on the quiz about calculating like a geometric mean by hand. Um, so, although I don't know, again, it depends on how comfortable you are with mathematical notation. No, none of these are all that difficult, you know. So, if I give you five values to, to calculate the geometric mean, you just multiply them together and take the fifth root. That's the geometric mean. But, but yeah, I don't think I actually ask you to calculate geometric mean on the on this quiz anyway so or, or harmonic mean so. um and then finally um yeah b because of some of the the things i've touched on um it can still be tough to 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 um compare the performance of two different systems just using like mips or or, or, or mega flops. Um, so really, if you want to get a good feel, whether like this ARM system or this this Intel CISC system is going to do well on my supercomputing scientific computing task, you're, you're probably going to want to to create a benchmark, or even just run your task on the two different systems um, and and measure. Uh, you know how long it takes um, for them to complete, right? And that's kind of where benchmarks come up. So, so because there's lots, because uh, differences is even if I've got two chips that are Intel chips running at um, the same um, same basic processor speed, but because of difference in the pipelining and the cache and all these other things, uh, even, even in that case, you can get very different performance uh, happening, um, uh, even with the, uh, the same Intel CISC um, architecture. Uh, so, so, so then, you know, you want to kind of go down to using benchmarks, right, which is really just an empir empirically testing how fast um, an architecture is going to work for um, a given problem. Okay, and there, there's there's problems with benchmarks as well um, um, because in, in this section talks a little bit about those. Um, you know, so different. I mean, if you compile them with different compilers, so even on the same machine with the same architecture, if I compile my benchmark with a 
a better highly optimized compiler versus one that's not so optimized, I can improve my benchmark speed, right? So, so you can get people doing dirty things though, that, that on, on the, the system that they want to say that they're performing better, they might use a worse compiler or a non-optimized compiler to, to, to do their, uh, to create the, the benchmark to run on the other system and that kind of stuff. So, so you have to watch out for people doing stuff like that. So, but yeah, all things being equal, um, uh, assuming people are doing their best to, to minimize things that like uh, compilation differences or others might happen, then you can use a similar task and you might get some information to compare my performance uh, on these very different computer architectures and, and get a feel for which one is going to do better. And, and that's why often, you know, you don't have just one kind of benchmark. So you have typically like the spec um, standard benchmark has different, like, like it has one for just general CPU intensive tasks, but then you have benchmark, um, you know, so like if I'm doing scientific computing, um, I probably wouldn't use these benchmark, I'd use something else, but, uh, but I might want to try to find a benchmark that's doing floating point operations since I know I'm, my, my scientific task is going to be doing more, lots of floating point op operations and run that uh, benchmark on, on my different systems to compare. Um, so a lot of these you can see are really meant for people that want to set up a big server room. So I might run the virtual um, SC benchmark um, uh, to see whether I want to buy a bunch of um, ARM CPUs or a bunch of Intel CPUs to provision my uh, server room or that kind of thing. So uh, if I'm going to be doing setting up a lot of virtualization. Um, so. Um, okay. Yeah, and, and you know, I mean, you should try and read through the details. There's a lot of details on on the benchmark here, but I'm not gonna. I don't think I'm gonna discuss those uh, here because I'm kind of running out of steam for one. But but the other is is um, um, yeah, you can kind of get into the ones that you're interested in to um, try to understand better here. So. Um, okay, uh, yeah, so I think, I think that that's all I kind of wanted to say. Um, does anybody have any kind of questions that they want to ask or, um, anything you want to uh, talk Dr. Sure, yeah, good. Uh, I actually was having some issue with this class because like I do not have a computer science background or like mathematic background. I came from a linguistic field. So I wanted to know how much of these stuff, like how much of these computations should be like, how deep should we go through it? Because sometimes I go through the whole things for two, three times. I still like, okay, what is it like? Well, so I, um, Th that um, I don't know if, if I'll be able to answer completely. Like, for example, I, I think my answer, my quick answer is going to be, uh, well, you know, if you understand it well enough that you can kind of pass the quiz, like, for example, to, to do the calculations with the Andel's law or the Little's law that I have, um, you probably did it well enough. Right. So, so yeah, I mean, you know, I know if you first, like, if you just look at like something like this raw, even for somebody that, that has done some things in mathematics or, or things like that, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, you have to ponder it a bit. So, so I hope like by kind of talking through the, it, what, the, what these mean in English, that ha that helps a little bit, you know, right. uh, and, and I think it is good that you understand how to apply, like, especially Andal's law, I think is going to be, um, uh, important for computer scientists um, because again lots of stuff is becoming uh, parallelization is becoming important so, so there, there's some fundamental concepts that are going on here that um, um, if you understand why this works and why you end up with this kind of asymptotic limit for different ratios of the portions that you can parallelize um, that will help you understand 
lots of things in general in, in, in different areas. So, so yeah, I don't know if that's completely answering your question. Yeah, I mean, the, no, the, the, like I took both quizzes and they were like very clear, very like very much like understandable and like, you know, it was direct. So if it is going to be like that way, I, I don't think there will be any problem. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I don't think anything's going to get any more complicated than this, you know, so it tends okay. to be like in this class, uh, when we run up to like a calculation or something like that, um, it might initially, you know, look a little bit uh, complex, but it, it tends to be um, the, the, once you unpack it a little bit, it, it tends to be, I won't say completely straightforward, but, but um, 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 not too, not too bad, I, I, I think. So, um, and, and yeah, I, I mean, if, if you can read a figure like this um, and, uh, you know, kind of after listening to me, uh, you know, and I'll be glad to go back over these and try and give more kind of context or more detail on these if I, if I can, if, if people are not quite getting them. But, but, but uh, yeah, at the end, if you can use them in this kind of the back of the envelope way that I was kind of showing or that we did in this first quiz, uh, that, that's the main goal in, in a course like this, so that um, um, you can answer questions, back of the envelope questions about design, you know, so whether it's worth it or not to spend a thousand dollars to um, do this component or, or to, you know, to, to, to spend half of your salary for somebody to redesign this floating point part of the chip, you know, how much speed up are we going to get? So, right. Thank um, you. Okay, well, yeah, I don't know if that helps, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the quiz two is due this Friday. So at this point, we've got one, one we're going to be doing one chapter and one quiz each week. So, so next week, we'll be working on chapter three. Uh, yeah, I had originally had that date a little bit wrong, but, but yeah, I mean, right now you should be expecting a quiz pretty much about every week, um, except for some weeks we, we'll probably just have a test, kind of a review test or something, so. Okay, yeah, so I'm kind of pretty flagging at this point. So, um, yeah, so I think I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording here. And, uh, well, yeah, so, you know, uh, yeah, so do do the, the quiz if you're watching, if you're here or if you're watching this, um, uh, make certain that you kind of get through the readings here um, and, and do, do our second quiz before the end of the week. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and then, you know, be ready for our third chapter next week then to, to get started on it.